Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Kaysen. With me today, the man who is thoughts become things, Neo Positivity. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. And I'm happy because this is day five of me being tested negative for COVID after having COVID for 12 days. So this is a, a banner week in that sense. I am climbing back to normality or at least something close to it. Something that would certainly not lying in bed. That, that's like, you know, mm-hmm. there's, there's a big difference going on there. So I, I'm celebrating that fact. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Neil, that. With, with the sound know, effects. I didn't know if it was going to come up or not. I tried it before. It didn't work. I got to go back and play this and see if they could hear it. For every, for, if it didn't work, everybody was in applause. Ah, that's great. <laughs> so how are you doing, Neil? Life is amazing. I just got back from a cruise. Unfortunately, I brought a little bug back with me. You know, a little something up in here, a little post-nasal. Uh, but no COVID, no flu, already Good. tested, I'm cleared. Now we're just looking at Zyrtec and cough drops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> a little bit of music mix. Um, but yeah, other than that, the cruise was absolutely amazing. The connections that I made, mm-hmm. I've never really been uh, you know, on a, on, on a real cruise cruise before. So that was an experience in itself, something I should have done in my 20s. Ah. Um, but yeah. Cloud nine, man. Cloud nine. I wouldn't say there aren't hurdles, you know, in life there's always them hurdles, uh, but I'm clearing them. I'm clearing them. I'm not stumbling. I'm not clearing them. And I'm I, and some of them I'm clearing on autopilot, which is what you got. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's when, when you're doing that, then you know you're in that high vibe state. Yes. Yeah. And stay Good there. stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm working on that right now. COVID kind of brought me down and other couple of things going on in my life including one you know about, uh, have been really weighing on me. But I'm working on it. I'm working on that automated state and not always getting there. When you're dealing with with crap, it's always, you know, it's it's a challenge to climb back into that state. Because you, you know have all, cause the crap keeps coming back, you know. I always compare the law of attraction to jogging. Like, you can't take a month or two off. You're going to get terrible at it. Mm. You know, the whole mindset, not just law of attraction, but mindset and setting that autopilot and there are certain monkey wrenches that get thrown into your life that are the equivalent of spraining your ankle. Yeah, yeah. So you can't jog for a week. And your ankle sprain was COVID that shut you down. There's no jogging for 12 days. And now you got to get back to building up. Right. You know, being back to that Olympic jogger. Exactly. That we all yeah. want to be. And I think part of it is being a little patient with yourself. You know, you're not going to get there in one jump. You know, unless you're the world champion, you know, long jump, you're not going to get there in one jump. <laughs> Especially if your ankle twisted, you know? What I mean? That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know so what? You that, that sucks, steps. man. We're so hard on ourselves that it becomes, our thoughts become counterproductive. They do. Yeah. And that's the sucky part. And that's essentially the challenge right there. You're dealing with the crap. The thoughts become nonproductive, counterproductive. What's it going to take for you to turn that around? What's it going to take for you to refocus? That That's the day-to-day, minute-by-minute challenge, really, is just dealing with that. And I'm presenting that question to our guest. Oh, okay. <laughs> that sounds cool. Because our guest our guest actually fits in beautifully with our theme, Your Daily Dose of mm-hmm. Happy, because she's a happiness mentor. I am. It's wonderful okay. to be here. Thanks for having me. My name is Karen Seitz. And K- Karen, you, well, you got to give us a little bit of the story first. Mm-hmm. You know, how absolutely. did you become a happiness mentor? And where did yeah. you come from to get there? Yeah, absolutely. So my journey to become the happiness mentor actually started out for me on a path of being a spiritual seeker. So yeah. in my Mid to late 20s, I was really struggling in my life and turned to therapy and counseling to really try to get what I called my adult feet underneath me. Mm -hmm. And it helped me to get to a place of coping and managing with my issues, which were a a severe lack of confidence, insecurity in myself, um, feeling like I couldn't really function as an adult, failed relationships, dysfunctional relationships in my family. And it helped me to cope and manage, but I kept 
finding myself going in circles and going in circles. And I had a friend of mine who said, have you ever considered going and seeing a healer or doing something more on a spiritual path? And it spoke to me and she studied shamanism and she got me into shamanism. And I started working with a shamanic healer. I then went through a rite of passage in shamanism to be able to work and help others. I became a Reiki master. I became a yoga teacher. I became a meditation teacher. Mm-hmm. I read Secret. I read Abraham Hicks and mm-hmm. I got anything and everything I could get my hands on. I started healing practice. And while I had what I called for me in my experience, a spiritual facade of really looking like I had things together on the outside, on the inside, I still felt really stuck and I still felt really bad about myself. And ultimately I began to feel like a fraud because the very things I was trying to help my clients do, I wasn't able to do in my own life. And while I was in it, I wouldn't have told you any of this. Sure. (laughs) It's understandable. While I was in it, it was, nope, I know who I am. I'm better off in my life than I've ever been. I get this. I'm happy. I'm creating a life that I love and that I want. Yet deep down, I felt this nagging emptiness, unfulfillment. I By that time, I was married, and my relationship with my husband was in total turmoil. I had massive money issues. Um, It was very clear when I looked at my life, the things that I was doing to try to know who I was, to gain that sense of confidence, to be happy, um, wasn't working for me. Uh, Not to mention the books and books and books I had on my shelves and, and was getting from Amazon Daily. Uh, I was a perpetual seeker. And what I didn't realize until I met my mentors who opened up a new path for me was that what I was seeking for wasn't in the books. It wasn't in yoga. It wasn't in meditation. It wasn't in shamanism or Reiki. What I was actually searching for was me Mm -hmm. and that I had to go in to find me. I had to stop going out And what I was doing unknowingly is that I was really trying to eliminate myself. And I was really trying to become some enlightened, higher version of me or trying to bypass me to become some higher spiritual supreme being. Something other. Something other than me, Karen. And what I really had to do was learn to work through the ways I felt bad about myself and that I didn't value myself to actually connect with me. And I wasn't in the books and I wasn't in any of those things. Mm -hmm. I was what I was looking for the whole time. And that's where I began to be on a path of happiness, which I define differently, which I know we'll get into today. But I, I had to really build a relationship with Karen for the first time. And the way that I had to do that was really having a profound awakening that I was the problem in my life, that it it wasn't my background, it wasn't my parents, it wasn't my husband, it wasn't the failed relationships, it wasn't any of those things, it wasn't my past lives, it was me. And that awakened a whole new path for me to really learn to take responsibility for myself and really begin to become and continue to become because it is a journey the best version of myself and really focusing on making choices and decisions in my life that allow me to feel good about who I am, not for external recognition or validation, but just because of who I want to be and the personal integrity and character that I want to have in my life. And that's the path of happiness that I teach and why I call myself the happiness mentor. I love that. I I love that whole story. I especially love the part where you're talking about how you you realized you were the common denominator. And that, I mean, I've been dealing with that for a long time, but especially in the last month or two, I've been facing it practically every hour because I've had a number of things going on that I can easily point to outside stuff, outside influences. COVID is one of them, you know, Absolutely. but there, there, there are many of them that I can be pointing to 
And I do, and I get upset, and I even get angry and frustrated and so forth. And then every once in a while, I think to myself, oh, wait a minute. I'm the common denominator. Damn. What do I do now? <laughs> mm-hmm. Start looking at it. Start yeah, exactly. It. Yeah. You know, because when, you, when you're searching outside, you're not going to find what you're looking for. I, I do reels on uh, Instagram and TikTok now. You know, short minute, one, one minute clips about the law of attraction. I'll put the links in the comments. But two of my reels, I'm going to do off of what you just said. And the first one is, I don't know who I am. And for me, it wasn't until I had that breakthrough that I decided, I, I, decided, I guess you could say, to break out. And, as soon, and, and that's how I live my life right now. I don't know who I am. And the only way for me to accelerate and find new things about me is to say stuff like that. I don't, yes, my name is Neo and I do this, this and that. But the future is unknown. What I'm meant to do, I'm heading down a path, but I don't know what it ultimately is. So when you focus on being a podiatrist and you're main, you were meant to be a gynecologist, there's going to be some kind of friction here in your life as you're pursuing the wrong one. So I love that. I'm going to make it real about that and strive to be you, not anyone else. Everybody I know, like realtor friends want to be the, the top realtor in Tampa. Mm. This friend wants to get a promotion and be the, 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 the uh, principal of the school so they can eventually get to superintendent. And they're spending so much time in the future, a future them, a future this, that they're not appreciating anything because they're not making the salary of the superintendent. They don't have the respect of the superintendent, the reach of the superintendent, the connections. So they're living their life in lack yeah. because they're, they're they're so busy in the future. So, yeah, I'm definitely make some reels about that. Thank you. I'll shout you out, too, on them. You know, that, lack, that lack, too, by the way, I mean, that it, it's sultry stuff. Hmm. It, it's not like you identify that you're living in lack. You, maybe you've been denying it for a while, but then you finally identify it, and it just goes away. Hmm. I mean, you, Especially if you've been living with that that feeling of lack for, for quite some time, it, it it can it can be quite the monster that you're still trying to overcome. Yeah, I, I, okay, I know I'm living in lack. I know I, I've been focusing on lack. I got to shift. Oh God, I got to shift again. I just did it 15 minutes ago. You know, it, it, it you can have so much momentum built up that it, it can feel exhausting trying to, it, to do that. It definitely is salty, Walt. It's definitely yeah. Is salty. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's true. <laughs> no, I said you said sultry. Sultry. I said sultry. Did I, 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 said, say, did I say sultry? I, I, don't, I don't even remember what I said. I, what, said what, but whatever it was, whatever I said, I'm standing by it. Let's put it that I'm, way. <laughs> you said sultry. I'm saying salty because it, it, that's exactly what it is. Mm. It's a taste that you just don't want around you. Yeah. yeah. You know. Well, it, if I can, what's what's fascinating is that what we live in as humans that we don't even recognize because we're so ingrained in it and it's so part of our makeup especially living from the mind is that we are constantly in the pursuit of happiness Mm -hmm. and that pursuit of happiness comes from that experience that we have of that sense of lack and constantly wanting more so how I define unhappy is I always want what I don't have And when we think about our human experience and our pursuit of happiness, get the degree. Once you get the degree, get the career, then get the promotions and the achievements, then get married and have kids, get the house, get the vacation house, uh, build your your time freedom and, and build a job you can work from the road. For me, it was get on a spiritual path and it, These are all these boxes that we're looking to check in life from this pursuit of happiness that we, we may realize that we're in, but I believe it's so, like, so pervasive that we don't even recognize that we're in it. Mm -hmm. And that most of the time and that very pursuit of happiness in our human experience is actually our human experience of being unhappy. Mm Because we're coming from that place of, yep. I want what I don't have, thinking that once I check this box, once I have this, then my life will be complete and I'll finally have everything I want and I'll be content. 
but let's be honest, we, we get it and it maybe makes us feel good for a little bit, but then we're this bucket with holes and it just leaks right out. And then it's like, okay, what's the next thing? And, and we just live in that and live in that and live in that. It's almost like a matrix that we get stuck in and we Many don't even do realize we're living in. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So Pursu- that's, pursuit, that whole pursuit is a feeling of lack in itself. Mm-hmm. You know? And if there's one thing I learned from being a cop is anything you chase will run from you. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't learn that in the police department. I learned that actually. <laughs> But that's it. So I consider that pursuit a chase. And if you're chasing happiness, it's going to run from you. You got to find it within. You got it. The answers are from within. The happiness is from within. That's why if you, you can't love someone without loving yourself. I'm sure everybody's heard that before. That's what it is. That, and that's why a lot of marriages fail. You know, people not truly loving themselves. So how could my spouse love me? How can my spouse stay with just me or whatever the situation is when nah, it's all in here? Yeah. Or in my experience, Neo, and, and, and what I've worked with with many people is I wanted my husband to make me happy. So when I got married and, and checked the box of, of getting married, I thought getting married would make me happy. And then I needed my husband to do things to make me happy and, and bless his heart. No matter what he did, even if he did what I asked him to do, it was never enough. It wasn't right. That's not the way I asked. Or, okay, great, you did that, but here's X, Y, and Z. I still need you to do for me to feel okay and for me to feel secure in the relationship. And that in itself, again, was coming from that place of once I have this, once my husband does this, once he stops doing that, then I'll be happy and it never worked. And that nearly destroyed our marriage. And and luckily I feel very fortunate. I found the path I'm on about six months into my marriage to discover, no, Karen, you're the problem because you're unhappy. And until you learn to find your happiness within. Hold on. Whoa. You just said something crazy. I ain't never heard a female (laughs) come out of nowhere and say, I'm the problem. What, <laughs> what was? Oh, we spread this. Whatever food you got, you sprinkle that all. A hundred percent, ladies listening, and and I'm being serious. If you are married to a good man, good men in the best way possible are simple, and all they want, all my husband wanted, and and he would say this today, and I tell all my female clients. Go home and ask your husband what he most wants for you. And I would bet you a million dollars exactly what he's going to say. And all a good man wants is for his spouse or his wife to be happy. <laughs> but the problem <laughs> is he, he can't make you happy. There's nothing my husband can do to make me happy. Because the only person that can make me happy is me. And the only person that makes me unhappy is me. So once I figured that out and I began to take responsibility for my happiness, understand what it actually is and a path to get there, my marriage flipped almost overnight. And all it took was for me to be happy because that's all my husband wanted for me. And then he could relax in the relationship because he wasn't thinking, what's the next thing I need to do to try to make her happy? He actually had to retire. And I'm taking a quote from Will Smith. He had to retire from making me happy because mm. there was nothing he could do to actually do that. Nothing anyone can do to do that. And from me and from my perspective and my experience, especially as a woman, that's the biggest problem that we have as women in marriage with a good man. Wow. Uh, one of my friends, I'm going to be saying this episode too, you, you, you're screaming uh, something that him and his wife should sit down and listen to because mm-hmm. it's absolutely amazing. And I had a reel that came to me last night. I'm hoping you guys can help me finish it. And the realization was no matter what bad event happens, it cannot be worse than my reaction and the fear and negativity in my mind about that event. You know, because you process it, you're like, oh, my God, this just fell apart and da-da-da. 
and you know you can make it worse than it actually is. Sure. So no matter, how, no matter how bad that event is, your mind can make it worse. So your mind is was really important here. Yeah. You know. And so I'm trying to wrap this up in some kind of real and end it with like, okay, so if you could get control over your mind in that situation, then dot dot dot. And I didn't finish it because I mean the situation's still there. It's still crappy. So if you guys had to finish that off, what would you what, what would you wrap that up with? I have to say, I'm still working on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Perfectly honest. Yeah. You know, it's a practice and it's a muscle to build. And it's not saying that challenging things don't happen or tragedies don't happen or hardships don't happen or loss doesn't happen. But what has been imperative for me in navigating the hardships in life, navigating the ups and downs, is understanding that life is neutral and that the things that happen in life only have the meaning that I put onto them. So in my reactions and in my emotional responses to the challenges of life, I'm creating my experience of that life event. So when I can understand that, and recognize my emotional reaction. It's not, it, it's not getting to a place where I don't have that. That's what I tried to do on my spiritual journey. It didn't work. It blew up in my face because I just suppressed everything, but it's the ability to see the emotional reaction that I'm having to that and take a step back and say, okay, that's, that's what you're creating of this in your emotional state. What's the reality of this situation so that I can begin to see it pragmatically and begin to embrace it as an opportunity to grow and learn, to navigate life, to believe in myself, to handle the curveballs, to handle the hardships. And in that, then it becomes a gift. It becomes a blessing because I can grow and learn from it. And it doesn't take away the significance that might have in one's life or the, or the tragedy that might be. But if I can understand it's neutral and my mind is what's wanting to make it bigger than life, then that's where I can take a step back and actually navigate it from a pragmatic place so that I can get through to the other side and use it as a learning opportunity. Karen, now I want to ask you something here because it's been kind of echoing in my mind and it just keeps getting louder and louder with everything that we're saying here. So I know I need to, to zero in on this. I hear everything that you're saying about happiness. I also have in mind what other people have said about happiness, that it's mm. ephemeral, that, you know, it, it comes and goes, that mm. it's, it's not something you can live all the time. Mm-hmm. And I get the very, very distinct impression that you have a different definition of happiness from most I do. people. So could you zero in on that? Absolutely. Thanks for asking that, Walt. We have happy, in, in my opinion, in my experience, we have happiness all wrong. And the reason that we live from that place of thinking happiness comes and goes, that it's um, frivolous to try to chase happiness in life or to achieve that in life is because we don't actually understand it. And I, and I didn't understand it either. Most of us, including myself, before I really experienced and understood what happiness is, believe that being happy is an emotional experience. It is an emotional state of feeling happy of living in joy, of feeling joy. That is not happiness. Happiness is actually a state of being. It's an experience of oneself without lack or want. So I defined unhappiness as I always want what I don't have. Happiness is the opposite of that. Happiness is I only want to be me, and I only want the life I have. It's the experience of no lack, of no want. And it doesn't mean that I want to be me and I only want the life I have because of who I am and what I get to do or what I have in my life. It's completely independent of anything external. It's an experience I have of myself where I only want to be me and I only want the life that I have. Because I value me and my mm-hmm. meaning and I, I am um, 
my meaning and purpose in life, not from a selfish place, but actually from a place of knowing as long as I give the power and control away to the things in my life to be my source of value, to be my meaning and purpose, that is where I'm always going to experience wanting what I don't have because those experiences are fleeting and they are outside of me. So happiness is something that we are continuously cultivating within ourselves of really being in a place of, of I'm okay no matter what. And it doesn't mean that when I go through a hardship or a loss or a curveball in life that I'm smiling and know everything is great. It means I'm experiencing the reality of life and I'm using it as a way to grow and learn about myself so that I feel good about who I am on the inside. And that's another really good way to, to take happiness down is it, I feel good about who I am because of the choices and decisions I make from a place of character and integrity of who I want to be in my life. So that means I can get the blow <laughs> from life. I, I can get the, the punch to the gut and know that I'm going to be okay because even in that experience, I still only want to be me. And I still only want the life that I have. And you're doing that consciously. Correct. I think, every, I think everybody subconsciously or unconsciously has that orientation, but very rarely do we have it consciously. Yeah. It, it's a very conscious experience and it's a very yeah. conscious place of self-awareness. And I would have told you on my spiritual path that I was the most self-aware person that you were ever going to meet. <laughs> and until I really learned to see myself as the problem and build a relationship with myself, I got very humbled and real. And my marriage was the perfect window into myself because I was certain my husband was the problem. Mm -hmm. And when I started to look at me, it was, I had to be very humble and realize I have no self-awareness. Everything I thought is being crumbled down and now I see myself and oh this is this is self-awareness so it's a it's a very conscious experience of oneself I want everybody please put up hashtag discipline because that's what she's talking about you have mm -hmm. to be disciplined with yourself discipline with your knowledge of yourself and discipline and practicing this practicing this more often than not throughout the day is what it takes mm -hmm. there's no if ands or buts you want this thing to work out for you it's going to take discipline and, well, and I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, Neo, what, how I teach that, that sense of discipline is, is what has spoken to me is really a commitment to myself to be the best version of me. And, and that's a, a journey to become the best version of me. But I have to have a commitment to myself of no matter what's in front of me, no matter who's in front of me, what they're saying, what the situation is. I have a commitment to myself that I want to do my best so that I feel good about who I am and, and the character and integrity I have as a person, that that commitment to self is imperative for us to be able to navigate the ups and downs of life and, and want to grow and learn from them and use them as the catalyst, as the vehicle to really cultivate that inner happiness. I want to ask you guys this. And both of you guys, separate answers, say no. Um, <laughs> picture an artist, a uh, musician, let's say, a rapper. Now, he's committed to this type of thought process. Not outside, not the future. Me and who I am now. I'm a great lyricist. That's what I do. However, and it's, it all sounds good. Because he's, he's got rid of the want for the Lamborghini and that lifestyle. He's just trying to enjoy his life now. However, he's scared because of things like writer's block that who he is, which is his voice and his mind, that's who he's associated himself with because uh, that's what he's really good at doing. He's like, I'm good at it. That's what I was meant to do. But he's scared because of things like writer's block that uh, one day that will go away. So that kind of eliminates the confidence if what you're hanging on to could leave you someday. So I'm trying to figure out what you would tell a person like that, because, you know, with times changing, 
rap isn't what it used to be. It used to be clear. People had a point. Now they just go on there and boo, 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 they mumble. No one even knows what they're saying. If you make a song that makes sense, it's not going to get any airtime. It's not going to grow. So things like that do change, which present an obvious problem in someone trying to have confidence in themselves. And this is their voice. Our voice is sacred to us. Our ideas and what we come up with and put them on paper are sacred to us. We should be able to believe in them. But in a situation like this, it's, it could fall off one day. So what would you say to them? Do I go or shall I? I can go if you want me to go first. <laughs> no, I, would, well, I hit you with some good questions. You know, this is, you know. For me, what we're talking about here, uh, I'm going to take a step back. What Karen was talking about, for me, that's true self-love. It's self-love based on loving the self without externals. And even, even your voice and your ideas. It, yeah, it, it, it's just, I love who I am. End of sentence, period. No other description necessary. That's what true self-love is. And it's not easy to attain. The reason it's not easy to attain is because we have so many distractions. We live in a world of contrast that we came to deliberately. And yeah, guess what? The distractions are everywhere. Drama is everywhere. Craziness is everywhere. Ups and downs, left and right. All this other stuff's going on. Of course, we're being distracted all the time. So it's actually a big, big challenge to kind of let go of all that for a moment and go back inside and just love who you are. Just for who you are. Not even, I mean... Uh, Karen describes it in terms of, of loving yourself for your own integrity and, and that, and that's great. That, that's, if, if that's the way that you define it for yourself, that works fine. But re- what it really comes down to is how do you feel about yourself without the externalities? It's almost that's like you're going back to birth before you get kind of, before you can think that yeah. I love that. I love that. That's a great answer. Yeah. So the, the person who is challenged by that is really being challenged by what I was talking about earlier about being distracted by the externalities. You know, the, the lyricist who is so concerned that he's going to get the, the writer's block, he's concerned about the externalities. Yeah. And he's allowing that concern for the externalities to get in the way mm-hmm. of how he feels about himself. And manifest writer's block. I just did a video about yeah. this the other day, two days ago. I don't believe in writer's block. Never had it. Don't think I ever will. When I sit down to write and come up with ideas, I get into the quantum field, I meditate, and they just come to me. Well, I, I, I've experienced it, and I can tell you that's exactly what we're talking about. Writer's block occurs when you lose track of yourself. That's exactly when it occurs. Get back on track, y'all. <laughs> Karen, what you got for us? Beat that, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, what this ties into for me is understanding why we can't know who we are from our mind. Hmm, yeah. There's no ability to know who we are and to love, to give ourselves true love to ourselves from the mind. And here's why. So the mind is completely based. And this is also the trap of unhappy or of the trap of unhappiness and why we can't be happy from the mind either is really understanding the psychology of the mind and how it works. And the mind is completely based on what I call external value and how the mind works is that it's a part of us that's created by the brain and when it's created by the brain it is innately empty and has no inherent self and how the mind works in our humanness is to create a self completely dependent on our external world nicely done so we create attachments to our external world like being a lyricist or being a mother or our job or a certain amount of money or being married and we look to those things to define who we are and to give us a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives which is what i call external value it's like a scoring system Mm -hmm. where am i in my marriage where am i in my career where am i at my relationship with my mm -hmm. kids you know it's it's really a way to create this definition of self, and I call that the false self, because there's no inherent self in the mind. And when we create those attachments to our external world to define us and give us that external value, how we feel about ourselves underneath that is that human experience of emptiness 
and the human experience of the void because we're not connected to a self. So we actually feel really bad about ourselves. And then we don't know, is this really who I am? Is this what I really enjoy? Is this what I really like? So we have to have a way to really bypass the mind and go into what I call the heart, where our true self lives, where an actual inherent self of who we are actually exists. It doesn't exist in the mind. That's so, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I love that. That's so I, really, really I, good. I had to have a tool to bypass the mind of who I thought I was. I was a yogi. I was a shamanic healer. I was a Reiki master. I was all these things. And what I found in my journey, which is not true for everyone, but what was true for me in my journey is that those things weren't actually being true to myself, Hmm. that they weren't an actual authentic expression of me. They were things that I saw like, that must be the answer. That must be what I need to do. I must need to be that. That's what's going to help me get to where I want to be. And I never slowed down to think about, wait a second, Karen. I never knew to slow down and think about, wait a second, Karen, is this actually you? Is this actually what you want to do? Do you like this? Never thought to ask myself those questions. So I had to have a way to actually get to my truth, which lives in the heart, not the mind, to actually begin to know who I was and and what I actually enjoyed and, and be able to define myself independent of my external world. I didn't have to give those things up, but I had to give up defining myself through those external roles and, and attachments that I created to give me meaning and purpose to even begin to have a sense of self and know who I am. And for me, I had to be open to to realizing some of the things I was weren't actually me. And so in this case, it it might be that in this analogy, the lyricist, that might not be who he is or who she is, but we get that writer's block because we might actually be on the wrong path of being true to ourselves. And we have to have a way to figure that out. And for me, that tool was used in a correct way and used from a place of neutrality. It's the only way it will work. I used a tool called muscle testing to begin to understand and and know my truth because my mind was not going to let me get there. So I needed a tool to bypass that. I've heard of using muscle testing to Mm -hmm. bypass the mind. Muscle testing is used in a lot of different disciplines. It is. We talked about that a few weeks ago on the show. Oh yeah. Yeah. But, but to hear it used as a way to bypass the mind, I've heard that a few times, not too often. Mm -hmm. And, 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 it sounds like you found it to be very, very effective. It's been critical because if I didn't have, if I didn't have a tool to help me break through, I'm going to use a new word and we can talk about it. Not a new word, but I'm going to use a new word that I've used today. Um, we have to break that cognitive dissonance of what we've bought into that we so believe and we've so doubled down is who we are and the stories that we live in, because we, we really believe that's who we are. If, if I hadn't had a way to break down some of my stories and my life of what I would have sworn by was me, I would still be going around in circles. And the, the, that was a breakthrough for me was to use muscle testing and to understand that the muscle testing is only as good as the person using it and how neutral they are. You, you cannot be invested in the, in the outcome or what somebody's truth is or what your own truth is. And it was, it was a critical, critical part of my journey to begin to break down some of the, the story that I had been living in that wasn't even real and, and wasn't even who I was that had me so stuck. And it was very threatening to, to begin to understand that it wasn't natural for me to look for my answers outside of me. That was the first thing that I muscle tested with my mentor. Um, as he was trying to help me go through a process, I was closing my eyes and he says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm waiting for the answers to come to me. And he said, where are you waiting for the answers to come to you from? <laughs> and, I, and at that time I, I was heavily into shamanism. I said, I'm waiting for my answers to come from my spirit guides. And in a very kind, loving way, he said, do you know it's unnatural for you to look for your answers from your spirit guides? And I, 
I was, I got into so much resistance. I wanted to punch him in the face and run (laughs) out of the room. And that was the part of me that knew Karen stay. Your hat, something in me knew you are having this reaction because you're going in the direction of where you need to go. Just stay and see it through. And that was a breakthrough moment for me because it allowed me to see the, the falseness I had been living in and, and, and know it. And then it was no surprise. I knew it all along. I had just been in such denial and such cog- cognitive dissonance of my experience that I needed something to help me break it down to get to my truth. And then it was so freeing because I realized I feel like I've been forcing this this whole time. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if I'm actually connecting with anything. And and I got to just be me and I got to just be honest about that. And the pressure just lifted and that opened the path to say, okay, well, what does resonate with you, Karen? And, and what is the truth of your experience? Um, and then it was very easy to let go of the things that were not actually me and begin to discover and, and know Karen Um, which turns out to be a very simple, normal, average, everyday woman who loves baking and kayaking and hammocking. And, and that's where I go to, to really experience and spend time with myself. And it's been a a true gift to be able to give up those things that aren't me. Getting out of your comfort zone. I love that. Like at that moment when you were resistant and you went with it. Mm-hmm. I always say that's when you grow. Yeah. You know, that was my big lesson for 2021 uh, for that year was the more every second I spend outside of my comfort zone, my frequency is raising. That's how I feel. And then I come home and I'm kind of like stagnant a little bit, you know, a little bit, a little bit. But then I go off on one of these ventures that I've been going on um, and I'm just meeting people and spreading my message. It's on my shirts. Everybody's like, oh my goodness, I, I saw that movie years ago. I haven't thought about it since. Next thing you know, they're teaching it to their kids and sending me pictures of their kids with wristband, my wristband on. Like It's just been an absolutely amazing uh, experience. I wanted to share this real quick, something you said a little while back. Um, I like to ask myself, like when I get into that headspace, I like to ask myself, who am I? And my mind says, Oh yeah, I'm a pilot. I'm a retired SWAT guy. And I said, no, 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 no. But who am I? Okay, well, yeah, I'm a father, you know, motivational speaker, voice of the thoughts become things. You know, no, no. yeah, but who am I? And I end up going, I'm kind of like punking myself to go deeper. Like, okay, but go deeper. Okay, scratch that surface stuff, go deeper. And my answer always at the end, at the very end, when I don't have anything else to say, it's just, I'm me. Yeah. <laughs> right when I say I'm me, that's when I feel more love for myself mm-hmm. than out of everything I just said, including being a father, which I love being a father more than anything. Stay at home. Dad, you know, got cussy all three of my kids. They're with me when they wake up to when they go to sleep. Well, my daughter's not with me anymore, but, you know, dad, my kids are my life. But that I'm me. That is like a weight's lifted and that lifting weight is taking my joy level up. It just does something to me. So I encourage everybody to try that, Mm. you know, go deeper than what you are. I'm a homeowner. I'm a real estate investor. Nah, we ain't talking about money. We're not talking about finances. Go deeper. Who are you? So I suggest everybody try that. I'm liking that. I'm also liking that uh, we're talking about something that gets to the core of who we are and in your words, Karen bypasses the mind Mm -hmm. because that really is a a critical element. I I love that we're bringing that point out. One thing that I I think we need to clarify, uh, Mm -hmm. because you mentioned the muscle testing, you mentioned that uh, you need to be in a neutral place. When we're trying to, to solve these issues, we're not in a neutral place. That suggests to me we need to be working with somebody else who's helping us do the muscle testing. Yeah, that was, that was critical for me, uh, to, I, I learned a, a path to become neutral, but to also know when I'm not neutral, uh, so that I can do the work to become <laughs> neutral. So in the beginning, uh, I did need to work with a mentor, um, and, and somebody who was neutral and had no investment in what my truth is, because otherwise I would fool myself and I would just be more, stuck in my head and, and so that was really critical um for me to, to have that experience with someone else yeah 
as an ex shaman mm-hmm. and Reiki master, mm-hmm. I don't know if you're still a shaman, are you? No. Okay. Um, how do you feel about a mentor or taking advice from someone who is really great at giving advice, like a Tony Robbins? I'll just bring his name up because everybody mm-hmm. knows who he is. Mm-hmm. Somebody who's given a really, really great at giving this advice to put you on the right path, but they're divorced, their kids hate them, mm-hmm. all their friends don't talk to them anymore. Mm-hmm. They're just not happy in life. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about taking advice from somebody like that? You know they're accredited. You know, they're, you know they wrote books mm-hmm. and helped a lot of people, but their, mm-hmm. their, their house is in shambles. Yeah, well, I think you bring up a, a great point, Neo, that... And, and I can speak from my experience of where I was and, and, and being a shamanic healer and, and being a Reiki master and having people come to me for healing, come to me for answers in their lives. And while my intentions were good and I, I did help people, I was not a true teacher. I was a false teacher. Because and of we, that. Because I couldn't do the very things that I was teaching my clients to do. And if you have, if you looked at my life, my life was in shambles. And that was a definitive, that is a definitive benchmark to somebody. Wait a second. Here's someone whose life is in shambles and I'm taking advice from them and they say that they can help me. That was a, could have been if somebody was really paying attention, um, been a definitive benchmark that I was a false teacher, not trying to do harm or being out in the world knowingly as a false teacher. It was something I couldn't see until later when I had the true experience of being connected to myself, the true experience of actually living what I was teaching other people that now I'm very proud to say, no, I'm, I'm a true teacher. And my goal in working with clients, even though I call myself the happiness mentor, is really to teach them, not giving them advice in their life. I, I do have structure set up in my program and how I work with clients to actually know very little about my clients' lives. And what I do is teach an educational program to really teach them the tools and the, mm-hmm. um, That's the, the things that they, <laughs> what's that? That's the approach I take. You know, when I yeah. when I do a video or something like that, if I was to do a coaching session with somebody, you could give that to anybody with yeah. any problem, and they're going to yes. come up with the same information. Yeah. And, so and, much more empowering. And there's several reasons for that. I mean, I don't want to get into all of them, but, you know, taking on your client's drama, you know, thinking about their problems later on, how you, because, you know, self-preservation, you see something on TV and you're running yourself in that scenario later on that night. Same goes for listening to people's drama all day, trying to give them, you know, dot, dot, dot information or coaching tips or whatever it is. So mm-hmm. I like that method. Yeah. Uh, my, the only book of Tony Robbins that I read, uh, 2009, no, 1990, no, no, yeah, I forget what year it was, 2002, probably 2003. Uh, and what I loved about the book was, he asked questions the whole book. He asked the right questions. Mm. He didn't, it didn't need to be custom to who was listening. He was given a full on therapy session and it worked for no matter who picked mm. up that book. And I love that concept and I've been with it ever since and it works. Mm. You know, it works on so many different levels. You don't have to memorize who's, who, who's having relationship drama with their spouse versus their kids. Mm. You don't really realize who's having financial, uh, memorize who's having financial drama and worry about saying the wrong thing to the wrong person. It's just like this. Here are the rules to the game. Mm. Insert yourself and you'll win. Mm. And that's what I love about the law of attraction, how universal it is. Mm. I love that. Hey, Karen, I have a, another follow-up question about the mentor situation. Mm-hmm. Um, because, I, well, first of all, we have, I don't know, I had to step away. I'm not sure if you guys went into how the muscle testing works. We, sh- we should probably include that mm-hmm. um, in the conversation. But also, how did you go about selecting a mentor? I think that's an important piece uh, as well. That, that's a fun question and a, a fun story to share. So, like I had mentioned, I had a healing practice. And um, 
I had a woman reach out to me and ask me if I would like to come to a, a free workshop here in Denver. And uh, I said, absolutely. And I went and that's where I actually met my mentors who were the first people to not just say that your answers are within you, but to demonstrate that in such a way I had never seen anywhere else, which, which was with muscle testing and really supporting somebody to go in and be honest with themselves as, as independent of the events in their life or their family or their upbringing or any of those external factors. And it was such truth. I could feel it within myself, unlike anything I had done. And I had done almost everything <laughs> and, and on my seeking journey. And it just resonated so deeply within me that I, I, I knew this is, this is the direction that I need to be going. And that's, so I, I often say it, it felt very fortuitous and very much like a divine intervention, um, that, that I, I came across my mentors in the way that I did. And it, it's been really lovely to see that my journey was exactly what it needed to be for me to get to where I needed to go and, and get on a path that was actually true to me and, and right for me and allowed me to actually really change my life and get out of the the problems and the insecurities that I had been living in and my own dysfunction of my relationship with myself. And it, it was very tangible, the changes I was experiencing and how lasting um, they were. And then actually having a true experience of connecting with myself that I really thought I was having on my, on my path mm -hmm. that I realized, Oh, nope, I haven't experienced this. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it made it very, it made me very real, uh, to myself. And, and that's how I knew this is, this is the path that I need to be on. And I'm very grateful for my mentors because they very much are not in a position of giving advice or giving me answers. They're very empowering to me to find my answers within myself and, in, and to help me see Karen. You already know this. You know exactly what's going on. You know exactly what your truth is in this. It's a matter of slowing down and wanting to be honest with yourself. Um, and I had never had anybody do that for me. Everybody else, um, all well-meaning, all well-intentioned, helpful in their own way, always connected my issues and problems to people and things outside of me or in my past. They never said, okay, well, how are you the problem here? And how did you create the situation? And why do you actually want to feel this way? Or why do you actually want to be stuck in this in your life? Um, and, and that hit deep within me and I needed, I was cra actually really craving that at some level for somebody to call me out. Um, and, and nobody I worked with before would. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it was actually very yeah. refreshing, uh, to get called out and, and in a direct loving way. Um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's why I found my mentors. I, I, I have to ask, uh, what do you love to do more than baking? What do I love to do more than baking? Yeah. Like is baking your favorite activity? Oh no, I do love to bake, but it's not my favorite activity. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, one of the things that I love most to do, I live here in Colorado, which is just a extraordinarily beautiful state and I really love kayaking. Um, that's one of my favorite activities is to get up early, get on a lake or a reservoir when the water is still as glass and just be out there with myself, uh, on my kayak is, is, and, and it's not the kayaking, it's the experience of myself yeah. in that. And, and actually, Neo, uh, where I discovered that I loved kayaking um, and blessed this community, I, I know they're really struggling right now, uh, but was in Mat Lache, Florida, um, was where I discovered that I loved kayaking, which was actually the eye uh, of where Ian hit. And uh, I just remember having this moment with myself on the uh, back in the mangroves and um, – a pod of dolphins went by in a Delta and it was just like, Oh my goodness. I, and I was on my own. My husband was sleeping in. I was out on the kayak. Nobody else was out. And it was just that experience of myself. Like the dolphins were just the, the cherry on top, but that, that experience of myself in that was just um, a, a wonderful moment to realize, Oh, this is something that I, I really love. So, but gosh, I do love to bake too. I can't believe you went out there by yourself, man. Florida's not the place to be going by yourself. You know, oh, yeah. In, in the wilderness. 
Oh yeah, no, it it was perfectly safe, and I felt safe within me, and it was just just beautiful. The only the only threat that I had of wildlife out on that that adventure, where I was going under some mangroves, and I I had to very gently use a little bit of a branch to help me through because it was a really narrow, and uh, up above were all these little blue crabs running on the limbs, and I I almost tipped out of my kayak because I I don't like little <laughs> creatures like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> running above my head and and that that was the the only danger was uh almost flipping out of my kayak there but i think the water was only about two feet so <laughs> but yeah it was a, a, a wonderful experience you no know, the reason why i ask i'm a huge component of doing what you love to do daily you know any any mm-hmm. chance you get mm-hmm. and i know you can't go kayaking daily and you can't even bake daily. No. You know i mean like everybody in your family yeah. will be 300 pounds and you'll be out of flour yeah all the time. so it's like yeah trying to find like I said I'm a huge advocate of that so trying mm-hmm. to find something like I love flying I mm-hmm. love flying but you can't fly every day because the weather's sometimes crappy but I fly a simulator on a computer when I can't fly outside mm-hmm. so finding that joy maybe not to the extent because I'm not actually in the air but I'm in it you know my oculus it looks you know like I look around I've taken it that far to get virtual reality so it seemed that real for me and I just want to get everybody involved in that, man. Just do, find what you love to do and try to do it daily in yeah. some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Don't I do actually, it once a year. Yeah. That ain't life about. I actually teach that in my course is finding the one simple thing that you love to do. Not because the thing that you love to do will make you happy, but it's a matter of making yourself important to you to schedule in time to do that one simple thing that you love to do. And mine is wrapped into my morning routine. Uh, there's a, um, I, I really love the experience of myself in stretching. So I use a Pilates, uh, what's called a toning tower and it's not for the exercise. I don't do it for that. It's really just the experience of slowing down and spending that time with me and an activity that I love. So I agree. It's really imperative to weave in something that you love to do into your daily experience, not for that activity, but actually making that time for yourself to show yourself that you're important to you because that's how you actually cultivate valuing yourself and feeling good about who you are and that experience of being happy. I, I want to get back to the question I asked a moment ago because you told a beautiful story about how you found your mentors. But the question I really asked was, how does one find a mentor? Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know positivity.com. Yeah. <laughs> there you yeah. go. Yeah. I think, uh, for everybody, it's, it's finding, um, one, I think you have to really decide that you want to change. And I know it can sound crazy, but a lot of people and, and myself included, the things that I chose before, um, were things unconsciously that I could make it look like I was doing something without actually changing. And I had to get a point to a point in my life where the pain of where I was was greater than the pain of moving forward and changing and actually wanting to change. And once I made that decision of I really want to change, then I think it was about a month later because I began to realize, not in a, a super conscious way, but something was rattling inside me to know what I was doing wasn't working. And it was either that the things I was doing didn't work for what I was trying to use them for, or there was something wrong with me that they weren't working. And I, I chose the latter that they're there or the former that the things I was doing weren't working. It wasn't something wrong with me. And once I made that decision that I really wanted to change and find something that would allow me to change and find my true self, that's when I began to to find my mentors. And that's when I got the call from the woman saying, hey, do you want to come to this free workshop? So first, it's really making that decision to change and then finding what resonates with you um, and and finding somebody that you connect with and finding somebody who will actually be honest with you and be direct and hold you accountable and doesn't let you stay in your stories uh, is crucial. So, man- so manifest it and... Stay confident <laughs> yeah, was, and follow the signs, basically. Yeah. I, I was going to say, literally, it's attracted. Mm. In other words, no trying to make it happen. Just be true to how do you feel? Do you really want to make change? Mm. 
it, because for, let, it's let's, we got to be really honest about it. Very often we don't want to change. That's I mean that's that's just the truth. You know. Quick quick story. I was talking to my friend earlier, and he has an option to stay stay with his wife or leave her for an ex or join the dating pool again, which he just totally doesn't want to do. So he has these two options and he's been battling them for months now and it's driving him up the wall. Uh, my thing is this, when you got that tunnel vision on just those three options, that's all you're going to get. Mm-hmm. You got to be open to more things happening. Mm-hmm. Once you open up, that's when it comes. So if you're like, I need a mentor, but I haven't been able to find one. How do you find one? I'm going to ask all my guests and see what see what answers I get. That's where you're at with this tunnel vision. Whereas I have one and I'm happy with my mentor is the last thing from your mind. But that's the first thing you need to be thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sit on that one. <laughs> this has been really a fascinating conversation and I've loved every minute of it. So I want to thank you, Karen, for uh, joining us today. Uh, before you, you go... Two things. First, we got to find out for somebody who wants to reach out and learn more about you and, and mm-hmm. what you have to offer. I know you have a, a program, the happiness course. You, you know, you got to tell you. people how to find you. Yeah. So, and you can find me actually at a uh, happinesscourse.com. That's a happinesscourse.com and, uh, find me there and, and there's a place to reach out to me. I'd love to connect if what I shared with you today speaks to you and, and you want to learn a different path than maybe the one you've been on. Uh, to really connect with yourself and, and to build inner happiness. Is that it right there? Is that yep. right? You got it. Thank you. Uh, happinesscourse.com. We'll make sure we put it into the show notes as well, too, so that people can find it easily. Great. And then Neo knows uh, I have a practice, and boy, is, does it apply today, let me tell you. But I make it a practice with all guests who come on who are you know, helping people, giving to the world and so forth. And it really applies in your case. There are many people you've met, ever met, you've never seen, and that you never will meet, you never will see who you have touched in some way. You've done it, you know, you've done a podcast, um, you put out your course, um, you, you, you've done a number of different things that, that leads to content that people consume. And in, and there are ways that you have helped people that you never knew about. Mm. We don't get enough recognition for that. So I want to thank you on their behalf for what you've been doing all this time to help those people and what you're continuing to do going forward helping these people that you'll never meet and that you'll never see. Thank you so much, Walt. Thank you. So we appreciate you so much. Neil, I appreciate you so much. As usual, you just, man, you just bring the questions that are great. They're wonderful. Heck yeah. And my new thing I'm ending the shows with, I just want to shout out all military and first responders. Thank you for your service. That's beautiful. We're we're recording this on Veterans Day, so absolutely perfect timing on that. So thank you guys very much. Thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.